Yes, hi. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me here on the call. Um, so I think I need Susan's help now with pulling that presentation up. Okay, there we are. Good. So um, those are the points I want to walk you through today. Um, your quick um, objectives of the study. Again, then the station development, the websites that were created, and then um, most of the time will be dedicated towards showing you some of the data that we've been gathering. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, um, Dr. Turner already nicely summarized this. There's several objectives um, covered by this program. So the first one is um, to monitor greenhouse gases um, released from the footprint of the city with a goal to assess the city's path towards um, sustainability. Um, the second point was to monitor primary oil and gas emissions, and then to provide these data and interpretations to the public, and as well um, to the research community, industry partners, um, and so forth. Um, the next slide, please. And we are monitoring quite an array of different atmospheric um, variables. Uh, most of these are, are atmospheric gases, and I've listed them here again. So these include carbon dioxide, methane, a whole series of volatile organic compounds, so abbreviated as VOCs, um, and we'll see several of those further down. Then we're monitoring nitrogen oxides, we're monitoring ozone, also particulate matter or aerosols, and then meteorological variables. And then the sites also have webcams. And all of these measurements are conducted automated, continuous, and year round at um, very high time resolutions, so minute to one hour time resolutions. Uh, next slide, please. This is an um, overview of the timetable of the progress we've made. Um, the first phase was identifying sites, designing the website. Um, identifying the type of buildings and structures we needed. Uh, it took quite a while for the buildings to go into place and then um, be um, provided with power and internet. Um, then the first location the at the, the airport became available for us to move in in September. And we pretty much got um, everything up and running within a few weeks. And ever since, um, the systems have been producing data. The second site um, at the Union Reservoir, um, the building became available in December. It took us about six weeks to get all systems up and running. And ever since, both um, sites have been reporting data um, continuously. Next slide, please. Again, this is um, where the sites are located, and I need to familiarize you with the abbreviations we're using here. LMA stands for Longmont Municipal Airport. You'll see that down in the presentations a lot. And that site is located on the, in this, the southeast corner of the airport where this asterisk there is. Oh yeah, thank you for pointing this out. So it's been the fenced area of the airport, and I, I, it's turned out to be a really nice, nice location. Um, we like that it's, it's it's nicely protected and guarded. Um, and the next slide then I think shows um, again the, the the infrastructure. It's it's a trailer and a measurement tower right next to that. You saw that already. The tower accommodates uh, meteorological sensors, inlets for the gas measurements, and then on the left you see the instrumentations inside the shelter, which in this case are monitors for ozone, methane carbon dioxide, and then computers, communication systems, data logging, and so forth. Next slide, please. And moving on to the Union Reservoir. So we're right there where there's that star is put on the map. It's within the park area. And again, what's nice, it's a gated area. So um, um, the, 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 the park staff are keeping an eye on it. So it's in the southwest corner of the um, Union Reservoir. And here the abbreviation we're using is LUR for Longmont Union Reservoir. Next slide, please. And again, that shows the, the building itself. So this is a hard permanent structure put in place, again, with a tower right next to it. Um, and on the right side, you can see the reservoir in the background. This gives you an idea about the distance to the water edge, which is about uh, 20, 30 meters or something like that. Next slide. Um, there's a much higher number of instruments in this 
um, facility, since we're doing far more measurements here. Um, aerosols are being sampled so on the left side that shows the aerosol equipment. That's a sampling stack that goes th straight through the roof of the building. And then again, a tower with meteorological sensors, gas inlets. Um, and then the, the, the center picture shows the instrumentation. And here we're monitoring ozone, nitrogen oxides, VOCs, methane, CO2, and again, equipment for communication, data logging, and so forth. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, those two sides um, here with a double red um, circle, um, those are the two Longmont sites. And what I'd like to point out is that um, this is actually now part of a regional network. And what makes this, this really valuable and, and what adds um, high value is that we have these comparison opportunities since we're doing um, simultaneous monitoring now in uh, two sites in Broomfield, as well as the um, Boda Reservoir, it's in the up, upper left corner. And um, we've learned a lot about um, what's happening in Longmont by comparing these observations. And I'll show you a lot of these type of comparisons. And it's also, of course, nice. This is all now under one roof. So this, this allows us to do this with very consistent mm -hmm. um, measurements um, for these comparisons. Next slide, please. And then we designed websites, and some of you may have seen this by now. Um, this is the site dedicated for the um, Longmont um, air quality observations, and it has seven tabs that you can see at the top. There are the, the webcam images from the two sites. They're updated every 30 minutes. Then there are tables that show the meteorological data, the current data, the past eight hours, the, the maximum of the last over the last 24 hours. Then there are tables that report the chemical measurements. Um, and then at the bottom is the same for the Union Reservoir. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, besides that site, we also, um, just over the last month, generated an, a, a sister site, so to speak, that then provides these observations from all these other sites that I just showed on the map um, side by side in one set of graphs. Um, so this shows the methane, the ozone, and nitric oxide data. There's, there's ways more of these plots on the same website, but you can see with the color traces then how the data from the long one side, so that's LMA and LUR, compare to the observations um, being made at the same time in these other locations. Um, which you know gives you an idea how you um, experience high levels, low levels, average levels, and so forth. Next slide, please. Um, so we are we're currently managing websites from these three different monitoring programs in Longmont, in Broomfield, and at Boulder County. And um, they're all um, shown here just with some screenshots. And what I'm listing here also are the visits and the site visits where we have counters, visit counters on these sites. And what I find remarkable is that actually right now Longmont has taken the first place. Um, it's the busiest site, gets the most visits of all these other sites. I mean, they're all pretty busy and being being well recognized. Um, but just over the last two months, we've gotten um, 2,000 visits on the long one sites, so about 1,000 thousand a month, 30 a day, roughly like that on average. The next one, please. And then we just generated this, this site, um, which is a data analysis tool. Um, and this is just a screenshot to give you an idea what you can do here. You can select in the left panel the sites that you want to um, investigate. And then on the right side, you can select the, the variable that you want to plot. Then you have a time window. Um, you can select the start date and the end date, and then just click go. And then it will generate graphs with um, these data um, all plotted together. And in the following, I will now show you many, many graphs that were generated with this, this tool. So let's move forward to the next slide. Okay, so let me walk you now through some of the data examples, um, data we've gathered so far. And I'll want to start out with ozone. Again, ozone um, is of quite some concern in this region since we are, since we're in a non-attainment um, area for, 
for the ambient ozone standard. And it's a secondary pollutant. So again, it's not emitted directly, but it's formed in the atmosphere during the day. Um, and you need sunlight for that. It's a photochemical reaction um, with atmospheric precursors of nitrogen oxides and VOCs. And given the dependence on lights, you get more of that in the summer when you have more light and longer days. Um, ozone is a strong oxidant and it impacts your respiratory system. So elderly children, people with respiratory um, illnesses are uh, uh, even more so affected than the average person. In the bottom, you can see um, the data from February through just a few days ago, um, ozone from the two monitoring sites here in Longmont. And you can see we've, we've exceeded the um, this ambient national air quality standard on quite a number of occasions. And I will um, explain that a little bit more. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, this is now zooming into one of these um, records. This is three days of ozone data. And again, what you see here are the data from the four sites that currently report ozone. Um, and you can see it goes up and down, up and down every day. Um, the lows are at night, the highs are in the early afternoon. And um, again, the dotted line is the standard. And just a few days ago on the 21st, you can see that ozone at all of these sites exceeded the standard. And you see how similar ozone behaves at these different sites. So ozone, it's a regional pollutant. It takes a while for it to build up. Air moves around during the time. So it's not like, you know, you have a certain neighborhood or a street corner where there's much more ozone than um, a block away. It's a regional pro pollutant and we, we all um, experience very similar levels here. However, on average, um, um, the highest level we've seen so far at the Boulder Reservoir and at the uh, um, Longmont Airport, you can see that here um, as well. That's where the, the ozone peaked on the, on the 21st. So let's keep going to the next slide. Um, What's important to understand is that the health standard is defined as the eight hour moving average. So when you get ozone readings that pop above the 70 ppb threshold, it doesn't mean that you violate the standard because this, this event may be rather short. So in the top graph, you see these spikes that go over the, the dotted line, which is the standard. Um, and then the, the smoother line, and it's en enlarged in the bottom graph, that's the eight hour average standard. It's the eight hour moving standard. And you can see that during this time window in June, there were two days where the standard was actually exceeded. So this is a real exceedance of the standard. Um, whereas, you know, you may have short term um, spikes over the line that would not be um, considered an exceedance of the standard. But still, we put this line in the graphs to give you an anchor point um, where the standard is in relation to the current ozone level. Next slide, please. Um, I want to also um, show you a very interesting, <laughs> interesting situation we had to, to help you understand what's driving ozone in this region. Um, so this was in um, well, just a couple of weeks ago, early July, um, three days of data. And you see ozone goes up, goes down, goes up. But why? What's happening on the 10th? What happened on the 10th? Ozone goes up as usual during the morning. And then bang, it took a nose dive right around noon, bottomed out, you know, and it was heading way high to exceed the standard that day. But then it collapsed. So um, let's take the next slide. Um, and that shows you nicely the value of just the meteorological observations. What I have here now in the second and third graph are the wind speed and the wind direction measurement from that same period. And that blue line then shows you what happened during this episode when ozone um, dropped. You can see what happened. Well, it got really windy. The winds, you know, they were pretty mild, moderate, one, two meters per second. That's the second graph. And then, whoa, right around noon, winds got really, really strong. And now look at the bottom graph. The winds shifted. They shifted from in the morning, so it was easterly winds. And very abruptly, they shifted to the west. And then 
they flip back to the east, right? Yes, thanks for the cursor help. Perfect, yes. So, you know, this this is actually really interesting because, you know, we, we, we sometimes hear opinions out there stating that, you know, ozone is due to background, or high ozone background and ozone moving in from outside of the state, you know, as, but you can see here as the winds move west, um, transport comes straight over the mountain, um, you know, ozone drops down to 50, 55, you know, we're in a much cleaner ozone environment. And then ozone shift back to the east, you get flow from east of the city, and bang, it goes way up again, and it exceeds the standard on that day. That shows you how sensitive our ozone conditions are to the transport conditions at any particular time of day. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, so ozone summary, what have you learned about ozone? So ozone is monitored at both um, the airport and the reservoir. So far this season, we had had four days with exceedance of the national ambient ozone air quality standard. Um, the exceedances at the airport have been slightly higher than at the, rest, at the um, Union Reservoir. And most times there's higher ozone in easterly winds than in westerly transport. So let's move on to the next species, and that's um, methane. This shows um, the methane results. And so again, methane, what's the deal with methane? So methane is a very strong climate gas. It's the, the second strongest um, warming force um, um, causing global warming. And it has quite a variety of sources. Um, they're, they're in, indicated in these pictures up there. So in the region here where we are, it appears that, you know, oil and gas is really the, the, the dominant sources, dominant source, contributing source for methane. At the bottom now you see the graph of the methane data and it shows methane for the reservoir, for the airport, also in Boulder. And then um, later the spring ozone came on light in Broomfield and that's the green data. So you can see it goes up and down, up and down, up and down, lots and lots of spikes. And you see a lot, a lot of purple and purple is, um, the purple spikes are higher than what the spikes we see at the airport and what we see at the, um, the reservoir. And um, if you go to the next slide, I think I have that blown up there. Yeah, yeah. So there you see um, now uh, maybe some 20 days or so and you see you know, it's it's the bottom of the data is always the same even because there's a background in methane that's very uniform across the globe. But then on top of that background, you see these spikes and they're very short. You know, they're just a few minutes, um, half an hour or something. And you can see most of the spikes are in purple. So at the Union Reservoir, we see a far higher frequency and higher resulting concentrations in methane than at any of the other sites. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a comparison of the six months of data um, between the Boulder Reservoir, the airport, and the um, Union Reservoir. Um, and um, you can see the green box whisker plots where the, the middle line is the median, the box is from 25 to 75 percentile, and the, the top of that that whisker, that's the 95 percentile. So you can see every month of, of that period, um, Union Reservoir had the highest methane, both in the median, both in the extreme values, um, the Longmont Airport was in between, and the Boulder Reservoir, the Blue Data, had the lowest methane overall. And um, the next slide, you know, shows the, the likely explanation for that. Um, which is the proximity to the oil and gas development. So all these dots and there on the map, oil and gas wells, and you can see the Union Reservoir is the closest, um, the airport possibly the second closest, and the Boulder Reservoir is about the furthest away. And that nicely correlates with the um, distribution in the methane data we are seeing. So next slide, please. Um, to show you how dynamic this can be, it's a really interesting event. And this actually has been the highest methane spike we've, we've ever seen, both in three years at the Boulder Reservoir, um, three months in, in Broomfield so far. And this occurred on March 26th. And within just a few minutes, methane went up from the, the about two ppm background values all the way to 32 ppm, so 15 times as high. Um, 
you can see this just lasted 15 minutes and then it came down again and it was pretty much normal. So the spike where it went up just like, like crazy, um, very short, short event. So what happened? Um, let's look at some other variables that were measured. Thank you. Um, so the bottom two graphs now show the wind direction and the wind speed during that same time window. And you see these, these dotted lines. Um, show this, this, this time window. So the wind direction from that, the average across that 15 minutes was 33.5 degrees. Wind speed, two meters per second, which is, you know, it's, it's moderate, but you can really refine a pretty well, a pretty well the wind direction and a transport. So, um, so wind direction, 335 degrees. Let's look at the next slide. Um, that puts that now on the map. So the, the star shows where the, the measurement station is, the monitoring station, and the fat arrow in the middle is the 335 degree window. And then I'll put like 15 degrees uncertainty windows on both sides. So that's roughly, you know, where this, the sector from which this methane plume was transported to the Union Reservoir. And then the circle, gives you, you know, how far the transport approximately is within a five minutes um, transport period, given the two meters per second wind speed we had. Okay, the next slide, please. Okay, then we have these data analyzed um, as wind sectors on the left, this shows um, the wind roses and on top of the wind roses, the colors show you know, how the methane is depending on if the wind comes from one direction versus the other. We can also do these heat maps on the right side. So let's just look at the one on the top for the Union Reservoir. So imagine yourself, the station is right in the center of that cross. And you can see that most of the methane, the, the redder colors, um, occur from winds to the north, slightly to the northwest, and a lot from the northeast sector. But there's much lower methane when air comes over the city to the south, um, west, and um, further away, or at, at higher winds from the south, um, from the northwest sector as well. So let's go to the next um, slide. So that's the summary on methane. So we're collecting very fast data, five seconds, high resolution data at both sites. We're seeing a high abundance of spikes. They're often very short in durations. Um, the mean, the median and variability are highest at the reservoir. And the elevated concentrations are mostly associated when winds are from the north and from e with easterly winds. So that's the methane summary, and let's move on to the VOCs. Um, so the VOCs, we started monitoring at the reservoir in um, mid-February. So this, this graph here, it shows in blue the data from the um, Buddha Reservoir that had been ongoing for two, three years. And then we turned our instruments on at the reservoir and said, wow, what's going on here? We were, we were really surprised. Um, because the levels we were seeing in February, March at the reservoir were, um, as you can tell here, significantly higher than what we'd ever seen at the Boda Reservoir before. And so the compound we're looking at here, ethane, is um, our favorite oil and gas tracer. Um, because there's really no other significant sources for ethane. Um, so you can see, you know, ethane was, was, was really high, lots of spikes, uh, much, much higher than what we see at the Boda Reservoir. And I think the next slide um, enlarges this. Yeah, so again, the time frame for this, very interesting observation. I would say, you know, it's one of the most beautiful <laughs> data sets I've ever um, um, collected in my career because there's such a stark change, such a stark difference. In, in February and March, we see these spikes with 200, 300, 400, 500 parts per billion of ethane. And then as you can see, as the season progressed, um, it became less and less and less. And the last part of this record, it's really low. It's about, you know, as much as at the other side. So what's happened? Well, several things happened during this window. Um, we, um, we started slowing down with lots of our activities on right around March 12th, um, when the COVID restriction came in place. On March 20th, we started 
um, putting this data on the website and everybody out there could see, look, you know, here's, here's methane and other VOCs being monitored at the Union Reservoir. Um, on April 13th, there were articles in the local paper um, reporting about this air monitoring. And then in April 20th, um, you know, the, the oil prices took a nosedive actually into the negatives, which um, slowed down production um, activities. Um, so let's go to the next slide um, that again compares, you know, this, this, this whole window. And I've now added the very, very latest data. Um, and it actually makes you almost suggest that maybe um, after a period of two, three months where it was quite moderate, um, the levels are picking up again, possibly. Um, so that was ethane. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so another VOC I want to bring up is benzene. Benzene receives a lot of attention because it's one of the VOCs that's recognized as a, as a toxic compound as a, and as a carcinogen. And I'm listing here for reference um, health thresholds that are set by different agencies. So there's nine PPB standard for 24 hour exposure, one PPB uh, for long term. Um, the World Health Organization um, claims there's no really safe limit for benzene. So let's um, keep those values in mind when we look at some data that be on the next slide. Um, but before that, I also um, want to remind you, there was a lot of, yeah, the next slide, please. Um, there was a lot of attention, a lot of interest paid to benzene um, just a few months ago because there you know, have been observations of elevated benzene in the region um, just a little bit northeast from Flangmont. Um, these measurements done by CDPHE um, where one 45 minute measurement of 10.2 ppb was reported. Later that was revised to 14.7 um, ppb. So that's kind of the scale now to compare our data from the reservoir. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so this shows the benzene from the Union Reservoir and, you know, it looks similar to ethane. In February and March, there was a lot happening, there was a lot going on. Um, benzene spikes, many of them in the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 ppb range. And then come April, May, it slowed down a lot and, you know, towards the later part now, um, it looks very similar to what we observe at the um, Boda Reservoir and in Broomfield. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I think that compares that again on top. And these are into, zoom to the same scale. Top, the benzene data from the reservoir, Union Reservoir um, in purple in, in February and the bottom in May. Um, again, compared to Boda Reservoir and Broomfield side. Um, the next slide, please. And this is the very latest, just the last few days, weeks. And you can see, you know, it, it's leveled down where now the benzene is very similar to what we see at the other locations. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so where is this benzene coming from? Where's the benzene coming from? Where, where was it coming from um, in the earlier part of the record? So the four graphs here on the left, they show the benzene measurements. These are four hours of data. It shows actually three measurements we have. These were taken every two hours. These, these blue, the green dots. So first it was low, then it jumped up to that's the highest value, 8.5 or something. And then two hours later, it came down to two. And on the next graph to the right shows the methane plotted together with it, which we can measure at my high, much higher time resolution. And you can see the benzene peak coincided right when there was a spike in methane. So right together in the same. And then we did again what I showed earlier. We um, looked at the wind direction and the wind speed. And then the, the, the map on the right side shows where that spike roughly originated from in terms of wind direction. Um, you know, so this came from the, the northwestern sector. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And that now does the same exercise for the 10 highest benzene peaks we observed so far. Um, so, you know, you can see all these arrows are northwest, north and northeast. Very consistent, very um, 
very consistent story here that very obviously these, these elevated benzene spikes have some sort of origin that I would put in the northwest to northeast sector. Um, okay, and the next slide. Um, so this is the summary on the VOCs and the benzene. So we measure VOCs and benzene. Now hourly, we actually increase the sampling frequency since these um, spikes are so short and so frequent to hourly measurements at the Union Reservoir. We saw a very high abundance of elevated VOCs and benzene during February through March. Um, we saw quite a number of um, benzene observations between 1 and 10 ppb. Um, benzene at the Union Reservoir was much higher than at all other comparison sites, except the single measurements at um, Broomfield um, a couple, three weeks ago. Um, these elevated levels were mostly associated with northwest to um, easterly winds. And there's a strong correlation of benzene with methane that indicates this, um, this methane, uh, that the benzene has likely an oil and gas source. And then levels dropped very steeply in April, May, June, and maybe just pick, about to pick up again right now. And then I think I have one more slide. Is that correct? Oh, well, two more slides. So, you know, in 30 minutes, I only could give you some snapshots. There are other things we measure, other variables um, that I didn't even touch in this presentation, but they are up and running. There's some interesting um, interpretation in those as well. So what I didn't touch today were the nitrogen oxides, the CO2, as well as the particulates, which we measure in two different particle sizes. Um, so we personally you know, do this sometimes later, or you can call me and we can discuss it offline. And then the next slide, the last slide is a, is a summary that just summarizes everything uh, we went through. And I just leave this up. And um, that's the last slide I have, so I'd be happy to entertain any questions you may have. <laughs> All right, do we have any questions? Dr. Waters? Well, boy, just a really quick, simple question. Um, is, is the criteria for where the two sampling stations are located, um, just to get on, on either side of the city and uh, monitor flows, from the edges of the city to the edge of the city? Is that why it's Union and, and the airport? Yes, so um, Susan, could you please pull up slide 51? It's uh, yeah, a few ones down. Good question. Give me just a minute. Did you want 53? Um, 51, it should be 51. Mm, two, two up please. Yes, uh, back one. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so why do we measure it in two places? Um, so the Union Reservoir serves two purposes. You know, as I showed in, in the map that had all the well locations, the Union Reservoir is on the upwind side of the city from where we expect the strongest influence from oil and gas industries, which are mostly located to the, S, to the, to the east of the site. Um, so that was an, an, an early um, preference to have a site somewhere in that general area. And then the, the Western location, um, as you can see, it's on the other side of the city. And the, um, the argument here is that we wanna watch um, how air changes as it travels either east to west or west to east across the city footprint. And easterly and westerly winds are about the most, the two most prominent um, transport regimes we have here. Um, so this is largely driven by the motivation to monitor and watch over time the amount of emissions that's added to the air as the air travels to the city with the um, objective to watch the change 
in emissions and here in particular in greenhouse gas emissions from the city footprint. So this is driven, motivated by sustainability um, arguments. Um, the city has set itself the goal to drive greenhouse gas emissions down. So how do you <laughs> monitor if and how the city is moving towards this goal? So there's, this is actually really difficult to do. Um, but one of the things you can do is, is, is this, this map here, this, this, this cartoon, um, by watching how much is added as the um, air moves over the city. So we're doing exactly the same measurements in both locations using the same instruments, the same techniques, the same protocol for the primary greenhouse gases, which are CO2, which I didn't talk about at all really in the presentation, then methane and also ozone. So in between those three gases, we have about 75, 80% of the climate forcing um, of gases that are um, you know, contributed by, by human activities to, um, to global um, climate forcing. Um, so we're watching all those. Um, and, you know, if, if the, the city achieves its sustainability goal and cuts all this um, greenhouse gas emissions down to zero, then we should see, you know, the same behavior and very, very similar, similar levels um, in air as it travels across the city. And these are the pool to reference points that, that would be used for, for that comparison. And we already have, I didn't show it, but we've, we've, we've pulled data and compared um, data from the two sides. And we nicely see um, you know, how, how levels change as, as the air gets transported over the city footprint. All Thank right. <coughs> I thought the information was really good, Dr. Dub or Dr. Helmick. Thank you. Um, any other final questions or comments? All right, Do Dr. Helmick, um, as always, your information and knowledge is more than welcome here in Longmont, and we look forward to future updates, reports, and work from you. Yeah. Thanks, you. Let me to share this with you tonight. All right, great.